Good evening, boys and girls. Welcome to another live edition of the Highbury Squad. What a week it has been here at HSHQ. We have spoiled you rotten. And tonight, be nice, because we have women's football royalty in the house. One of my favourite writers. I've been trying to get her on this show forever and ever. We finally made it happen. She has a new book out. And the women's Euros are coming. She's the best person to talk to, talk to about this. The long intro was worth it. Here we go, as someone would say. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. Hola to everyone around this beautiful globe, to all our listeners across every single continent. Welcome. It's Friday. It is the weekend. For me here in the United States, it's a holiday weekend because it's July 4, which means hot dogs and hamburgers. And also for my guest co-host tonight, it means the same for Demian as well. Yes. Doesn't seem like a hot dog kind of guy, but Demian, welcome back to Highbury Squad. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Boom, boom. I'm so happy to be here, honored to be among the company of two greats, two people that I admire and respect so much. So I'm so happy to be here. Awesome stuff. And uh, I have wanted to get Susie on the show for a while. I love reading her stuff. Um, you know, when I'm in the pub, if I need backup, when yeah. someone says, no, that's not a fact, I'm like, well, hold on a second, I'll reference um, this fine journalist uh, right here. Her new book, by the way, which is groundbreaking in itself, A Woman's Game, The Rise, Fall and Rise Again of Women's Football. Uh, it's filled with incredible information. We're going to talk about that today. Susie Rack, football writer for The Guardian. Welcome to the Highbury Squad. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm very happy to be on. Well, um, just to, to let everyone know, off camera we were talking, we we're having a little chat about traveling and expenses and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, it just doesn't happen by magic, people. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in order to make something um, brilliant happen, whether you're writing about it or whether it's a team on the pitch and stuff like that. Uh, you guys know that we try to bring you the best content here on the Highbury Squad. We've been telling some great stories this week, and Susie, Susie's going to help us tell some stories now. I Before we get to the women's Euros, because we get a lot, and we've got a lot of DMs, and we've got questions for you. Um, you know, it's exciting, and I can't wait to talk to you about that. I did want to talk about the book, but I thought the best place to start would maybe be with Super Kev's question. Um, and, oh, where is Super Kev's question? I'll get it. But Super, Super Kev um, sent a question for you, and it is incredible how it's a little bit like men's uh, football in the U.S. You know, the old leagues with Pele and Beckenbauer, you know, and Georgie Best, and things fold, and then they come back. And then with the women's game, it's been up and down. It feels like it's been more like an international scene than a domestic scene. So I'm going to kick off with this question from Kev, and then we can get stuck into it. Hi, Sophie. Squaddies. Susie, I hope you're well. This is just a short question for you, Susie. Just want to ask how you found the journey, the football journey, the rise, the fall and the rise again, and the difference of opinion from the start to how it is now. Just want to know that. So I hope it goes down well and look after yourselves. Take care. Bye. It's a good it's a good question too because there are a lot of people that try to be experts now profess to be but the journey's been long you've been there um talk us through it and what your take is on Kev's Yeah, it's a question. great question. I I've only been there for uh I've only been around for you know the past like 6 7 years. I followed the women's game a lot longer since I was a kid. Um you know like benefit of being an Arsenal fan is Arsenal ladies were always the best. When I was growing up, trained in Shoreditch Park opposite my council estate, were there at the parade in 98 on their own bus, that kind of stuff. So, like, lucky from that point of view in that it's not been that unusual for me to see women's football around in the same way it probably hasn't been for you guys. And um, so, yes, yeah, so um, I suppose, yeah, like my, my journey is with modern football. But when I was researching the book, 
um, I was like quite a lot of the time really, really surprised by um, some of the views on women's football, but also just how overtly political um, some of the like biggest mm. pioneers of the women's game were. So like Nettie Honeyball, who, which is a pseudonym of the woman that set up the British Ladies Football Club in the late 1800s um, and organised the first sort of England's North East at North East South uh, game with Scotland. Um, she did an interview in a new paper and I've got a big chunk of it in the book I wanted to print the whole thing but my editors were like no you cannot put 1500 words of a newspaper article into your into your book um you've got to summarize it and uh but but like that interview was very much like her as a feminist as a um suffragette saying I am building mm. this football team and using it as a political act that it is pushing back against uh, loads of different um, views on women and football is a really useful tool because it's so popular in society generally and I was really surprised to see someone say that so overtly um, and then I was also really surprised by just how explicit and um, you know sort of unmasked the all of the vitriol against the women's game has been throughout history for the first time many hundreds of years or hundred years um, like you know even right up to sort of like the end of the ban and uh in 1971 and the ban on women's football from the fa in 1921 um like some of the language in some of the articles really surprised me and uh it's really kind of like vitriolic really anti-women really um you know sort of get back in the kitchen type stuff um and i i wasn't expecting it to be quite so obvious if that makes sense but then again mm. that shouldn't have surprised me because at the same time, you know, we get very similar views nowadays from, um, you know, like <laughs> trolls on Twitter and things. So it, it didn't overly surprise me in that sense. But it also I, I just wasn't expecting everything to be quite so overt. It was great. Mm. You know, what's interesting is I find that abuse and vitriol has existed decade after decade. The vehicle of how it's delivered is what's changed, isn't it, really? Um, and Demian, work, uh, you, you work with women at the, the very top in the music industry. Susie covers the best, you know, in the world at their craft. And still, you know, even at that point, there's unnecessary and disrespectful kind of verbiage that's thrown that way. And I'm curious, I like you, I like your comment on that, Demian, because I want to swing it back to Susie in terms of who the people, I think there are a lot of personalities on TV, right? Men that really don't like watching women's football. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that a lot of men in some of the media that we consume might like watching women's football, but they don't admit it, which might be even worse. Um, so before I give my opinion, I want to say a couple of things. I want to thank you, Sophie, for uh, not only as a friend, but now as a fan of the women's sport for you always trying to promote it, for always trying to shine a light on it. Uh, and there are not a lot of uh, avenues for people like me to watch. So I want to thank you not only for including me, but thank you for what you do. And Susie, of course, I, I'm sh I don't have a lot of words to express my my admiration and respect for you. I know. Uh, it cannot be easy following uh, covering the women's sport. Um, it's not easy covering sport as a woman. I can't even imagine. So I just want to tip my hat to both of you. And you both are pioneers on your, in your own right. So I'm just honored to be here. Um, I think the, the one thing that I will mention about Susie's point of us and, and yours, Sophie, as far as vitriol, I'm one of, the, one of those people that feels that you need to respond and, and not attack back necessarily in the same way, but you can't just let it be. You know, it's like, mm. you know, you're walking down the street and somebody cat calls and you're just like, oh, just, you know, oh, just don't worry about it. That's just boys being boys or haters being haters or evil people being evil. We have to combat that. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it can be an endless game, but I just don't think that that it'll go away, sadly, and it hasn't gone away. And like you said, the avenue is different or the tools are different. And if nothing else, now they're more empowered because they don't. Ha they can just be a faceless egg 
on Twitter, mm -hmm. whereas maybe when, what, what Susie was referencing had to do with a journalist or a, a, a man uh, with his name and last name, and he's speaking about uh, or on behalf of the Times or wh whatever newspaper article so or, or newspaper um, company or whatever. So um, I am a, of the belief that with intelligence and, and with an open mind, for ourselves, not for the trolls, we can try to educate them. And then we did our part. If they want to change their mind, fantastic. And if they don't, then we don't need them. We don't need everybody following the women's sport. We need people that want to follow women's sport to continue to follow women's sport in, in football specifically. Mm. Thing is, is the um, you know, one of the things that you said, Soph, about um, uh, that you know people like not you know not want it saying they don't you know they don't want to watch women's football and they don't like it and blah blah mm -hmm. thing is is they could just switch off right like they they don't have to pay yes. any attention to it that like this oh it's being rammed down our throat you can just ignore it like I could go around and go around saying during like a, a rugby world cup our oh, rugby's being ram rammed down my throat I only care about football I, I don't give a damn about rugby or cricket or whatever you know what like it could be anything mm -hmm. um and but I don't because I just choose not to watch what I don't like right um so like what what is it about women's football that is making people so like hostile that they feel like they need to comment like that and I think it is like underlying misogyny I think there also is just a trolling element that just like a wind up because I think that that very much is a thing nowadays mm -hmm. so, um yeah Susie, I also concept. think it I also think it's a threat it's yeah. disrupt yeah. it's disruptive to what people are used to you know, um, Uber disrupted the taxi industry, people getting ripped off left, right and center. Um, you know, Netflix disrupted the entertainment industry. Disruption is uncomfortable. Uh, change is uncomfortable. But for these women, they've been trying to make this game matter for years and years and years. And now people are like, all of a sudden, you know, this is happening. I remember when I've moved here and I was doing a show called World Football Daily. It was around 2010, 11. It was that crop of team Susie that was building towards the 15 um, major tournament. And I remember standing, I say, I've said this to Demian so often. I remember I'm standing on the sideline and I'm doing a special piece and I'm talking to Alex Morgan, Megan Rapino, I'm talking to Abby Wambach, um, Carly Lloyd, uh, you know, Christy Rampone, these are legends of the game. And there's literally four of us standing there. Now, today, juxtaposition this morning, Megan's press conference about the Medal of Freedom, um, which, by the way, congratulations, uh, Megan. She was on fire uh, at the presser today, as she usually is. Um, with her, you know, uh, character and personality. She was humble and she it's the first time I've really seen her that super super humble. She was crying um, quite often when she was referring to certain people. But now that press has got untold people in it, Susie, you know. So that part I like, as long as it's the right people covering the game for the right reasons. But there's a, can you explain from you, because you talk about the rise, the fall and the rise. And I'm giving you an example of that sideline experience. I'm one person plus three. And now there's like 50 when I go. When did that moment happen? Is it the 99ers? Is it from that period on that it changed? It depends where you're talking about. I think in the US, 99 was really, really critical, um, especially when you think about 91 and the team that won there, like went com like pretty under the radar in the US, right? So you've got the players having just won a World Cup in 91, getting on the plane to fly back and there's no one to greet them at the airport. No one knows who they are on the aeroplane. One, I can't remember which player, but one of the players turns uh, to the woman next to her the woman next to her is asking her about what she's been doing and it's like oh, oh that's very nice dear that kind of thing uh, really you know, <laughs> that's no crazy interest at all and and then you've got this explosion around the 99ers um it helps that it's uh uh, World Cup on home soil and that there's huge um, like huge crowds going and things like that I think America is particularly unique because the men's game isn't quite the same sort of barrier or block on the women's as it is uh, in England um, so like for, for the US I'd say definitely 99 for um, for the UK I'd say probably I, I think I think the Olympics played quite a big role yeah I'd um, agree with that and I, like, I think that 
well, a that was sort of a you know the round the the time that the FA were sort of taking setting up the women's super league and Man City were sort of getting on board uh, and founding a team and poaching some of the best players and that kind of thing. Um, so it was quite quite an important moment. And then obviously you've got the fact that the twenty twelve everyone just wanted to be a part of the twenty twelve Olympics, right? Like I went to Paralympic um, <laughs> swimming and athletics. I've never watched paralympic sport before never had any like intention of going not because i didn't want to just i just never really thought about it um but i just wanted to be a part of the vibe of the olympic village and the olympics and what was going on and they were nice cheap tickets and we had an absolute blast and i think football got the women's football in that tournament got that a little bit and Mm. they knew obviously you had like a good team gb squad which made people want to sort of go and watch them um and then also the final being at Wembley and like being a record crowd for uh, the women's game in England. Um, like, I think that really put women's football on the map a little bit and started the turning point. And it was like the, a few things coming together, you know, like I say, the a women's super league being set up at the same time, the, mm-hmm. um, some of the big teams like city sort of coming into the ring, Chelsea sort of at the start of their journey with Emma Hayes. Um, and there being a bit more of a challenge to Arsenal's dominance. And then, also yeah the the tv the rights help the, right yeah 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 no it's it's demian and i love to hate emma hayes just saying <laughs> just being she, she's incredible she's incredible <laughs> can, can i say something uh, really quickly about the point about being uh disruptive women's football being disruptive i think in, in a threat i think intrinsically women's football is it carries this social political component than men in sport barely ever do unless there's you know the Colin Kaepernick's of the world or whomever you know that has a specific agenda that they need to grab a flag and carry it women are the flag right women in sport are the mm-hmm. flag so it, it it threatens i think a lot of of men obviously because it it reflects it's like when, when sometimes when we do things, it, when, when some of us follow our dreams and are doing okay in our careers, sometimes people see that as a threat as if, because we remind some people that we're happy or we remind them that, or that they're not happy or that they're not pursuing their dreams. And a lot of men, I feel that fe- because women now are, pro- pro- now are professionals and they have this amazing league and they have people like you covering uh, the sport, it's like, well, why do they get to enjoy that? That that's what's supposed to have been my reality, but I never pursued it for a whole number of reasons. And they actually believe that they can be play better than Alexia Putellas, or that they could actually play like Beth Mead, or play like Brandy Chastain did, or whomever. It, it's just it it's mind boggling, and at the same time, it's very very simple, and it, it, it can be reduced to this sort of misogynistic uh, component that uh, mm-hmm. it's the anti women's game for in every every aspect you know it's also a lack of context right because like you look at say Alexia Putellas or a- any like women's player in the top league and when did they start playing professionally within the last like three four years maybe um so most of their career they've I've been having to work they've been having to study or like be paid for by family or partners or whatever it is um Whereas, you know, you've got even sort of the most mediocre men's players in the, you know, men's championship in England, for example, like have almost been groomed for professionalism, like from the ages of kind of like five, six, seven years old. So they've been in the best environments, the best coaches, the best medical facilities. And it's inevitable, right, that you're going to get a very um, polished product that they're, they're going to have developed fast, like faster than like anyone else it like their peers generally speaking and then also more than the women's players so it's not like it's you know the women's game is playing catch up but it is in a to a certain extent because we're not really going to see what um the best technically and tactically uh brilliant play women players can be um until we sort of get up to a point where we've got um women players coming through the ranks at that early age right with the environment and the support and stuff to to help them develop into the best they can be they've sort of done it against the odds and yet the football is still fantastic to watch right so how promising is that for the future of the game like how good could it be in my mind it could actually be 
a better technical and tactical game than mm. the men's game because women have to compensate for their lack of physicality by being skillful. Particularly, so many top women players played against boys when they were younger, right? And they um, that was like what they had to fall back on. They had to fall back on being better technically and tactically for to be able to play against them. And then they take that into the women's game. And I think that there's a huge opportunity for the women's game actually to be Obviously, it's all football, but like uh, something quite different as well. In the same way that in tennis, you know, obviously women can't serve as hard, but they they do different. They they much more dynamic and move around a lot more because they have to compensate for that lack of power uh, comparatively uh, to the men's tennis players. So you end up with a different thing, but it, that is still the same, mm-hmm. but like could potentially develop in a way that is really really exciting. I I completely agree with you, Demi, and I've talked about this before as well in terms of. The women's game really focuses on the football and less of the gamesmanship or the antics on the pitch. And I believe, especially when I was covering the 2015 World Cup, or both, that when I was talking to my my guy friends, whether it was here in Europe or my cousins in Australia, whatever, what they loved was like, man, the game just moves swiftly and fast things happen. And what doesn't happen is all of this diving and all of the, all of this, all of these antics. I think that is a huge part of the introduction to the game that people endears themselves to it, you know, as well as the technical, I totally agree with you. I think it's very underrated and underestimated the technical side of the game. Can you, can you just explain that a little bit more? Cause to me, what I've loved about what our club has done, we did an episode on this on our women's show a couple months ago was how, when Arsenal announced Mikel Arteta extending his contract, who was sitting right next to him with the announcement of his contract too. Now in my heart and my soul and deep down, would I wish that was a woman? Cause what a moment, what a photo, you know, what, what kind of a, a, a an evolution of the movement. But even though Jonas was the one, to me, it just smacked of, this is how we see things. Now, I know it's a good PR opportunity too, Susie, but I also believe we're a club that believes in what they're doing, what they're showing when it comes to our team. It's an interesting one, that, because I think there's an element of that for sure. And I think a lot of clubs in England, I say a lot, particularly the Chelsea, Man City, Arsenal, um, I was about to say Man United, but I actually don't think they do as much. But um, want to give this sort of one club public view uh, to, to to what they're doing. But actually, I think in England, none of them get it right. None of them. It's it, it is like really embedded in that way. Um, and I'd say that for Arsenal too, disappointingly. Um, so it is is it P, is it PR then? Is it because I mean, a little bit like my the film industry from when I was working here, you need more female directors, mm-hmm. you need more X. It's about a quota versus a belief. And so that that's, is that I what it is? I think it's a bit of both. I think there's a like a layer in Arsenal who genuinely, like a big layer who genuinely value the women's team and, you know, and, and the history of the club within women's football and, you know, think that it should be supported and stuff. But then there's a disconnect between that and ownership that means that you get full, proper investment. And I compare that to, say, Lyon or Barcelona in particular, where, like, Lyon's budget is, like, four or five times bigger than any other club in the world. Like, it's huge. And it's because they've got an owner who genuinely thinks that they should be... um, Backed as equally as possible to the men's, and he like when I, I interviewed him a like year and a half ago or something, and uh, John Michel Olas, and he was saying, and you know he's the owner and chairman of um, of Leon, um, and he was saying that like he want like will invest as much as humanly possible into the club, and obviously he's he's got to do so within the constraints of the fact that it is a business, um, and he does have to like run it as a business. Um, but for example, you know, I was asking him about how the, the, the amounts of money that some of the Leon players are on. The majority of the squad are on six figures, um, or at least the first team. More majority of the first team are on six figures a year, and you know, like that, Hagerberg's the world are sort of you know three, four, five hundred thousand, and 
but but that's like across their like that's across the board. Whereas in England, you've got a handful of players at each club. You know, like three or four at most on that kind of money. It's not like throughout. And I asked him why he he saw it as important to sort of push salaries way way further than he needed to. Like he could have just topped them up slightly higher than what everyone else was doing and been hugely successful, right? But he choose he chose to like massively um massively kind of extend the 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 top mark for mm. uh pay for women's footballers and it's because he believes that they should be earning as much as the men he's like trying to get like, obviously it's nowhere near as close right but he's trying to get as close to a respectful wage within the limits of his company as possible and i don't think any club in England quite like has that leadership that says we really really genuinely believe it like there's a lot of PR stuff Jonas and, uh, and Arteta uh, um, you know signing the contracts and you know sort of joint photo opportunities where like team squads you know this is everywhere team squad like Liverpool did it when they were um, like on the verge of being relegated where mm-hmm. the men's and women's players are all in together and I'll also do some great stuff like nice videos of Jordan Nobbs sitting down with Rob Holding and stuff like that. And I like all of that stuff. I think all of that's good. But at the core, like what is happening behind the scenes? And like there's a reason that Arsenal have been off the pace the past few years. And it's because of a lack of um, sort of behind the scenes commitment to the club from a financial point of view in terms of staffing. They've hired a whole load more staff. So there's been a little bit of a change. Um they're um, committed to building a new training ground for the women. Like little things like that that have sort of been rumbling on in the background for ages and not that not much has been done. Um, and you weren't really sure. You were sort of wondered whether the like, sort of support was waning a little bit or the interest was waning a little bit. Now they're starting to do something about it, but nowhere near the level of what sort of Leon and Barca, uh, Barca are putting into their women's teams now, which is disappointing and I think that's the next big sec. I think that's what needs to happen to really elevate the game here because you need to have clubs really, really presenting to their fan bases that their women's team matters, right? Barcelona putting the women's team in Camp Nou for, um, you know, the was it quarterfinals? Quarterfinals and semifinals mm-hmm. of the Champions League and getting 91,000 each time. Mm-hmm. They had... 37 coaches as well as people flying overnight traveling overnight from barcelona to turin for the champions league final 37 coaches of fans like now that's a 16 hour trip each way or or more and you've got a level of engagement there that i don't think any club in england commands 37 coaches going from the club to champions league final people traveling overnight what is getting that fan base so engaged um and it's it's the way the club treats it like it matters um, and really puts it centre stage. And I think like that, no one is quite getting that right here at the moment. My mind is blown just a little bit. Um, <laughs> this is why I love reading your stuff. And look, have, having been kind of a PR person in the entertainment industry for the majority of my career and then switching you know, to, to sports, even though sports was part of that, I understand the the spinning and the PR side of things, what you want the audience to think and believe uh, to be true. Um, and there's a lot of that that goes on. But what worries me, Demi, in a little bit is it's reflective of what's going on in the men's team, kind of, sort of, and why we've fallen behind. And when you said like that a little bit, in my mind, I'm thinking, just before Demi and Susie, are City and Chelsea aligned more with Leon? I've always felt like, Chelsea and City, nowhere near, of course, Barca and Leon investment, but a little bit closer to it. Are we far away from them? I or... think we're pretty we're pretty close to City and Chelsea, to be fair. Yeah. Um, we're not far off. Chelsea have sort of bucked the trend a little bit. You know, they paid big, big money for Sam Kerr, for big Sam, yeah. money for uh, Penilla Harder. Um, you know, they when they signed Frank Kirby, she was the most expensive player in mm-hmm. the like in the league when they recruited her from Reading. So like and I would say they are probably the team that is the closest to 
a sort of more genuine one club feel um like you get it you really feel it in the environment and all like they they talk about it a lot and emma hayes is really big on it um and it does sort of feel like that i mean obviously who knows what's going to happen like they're like ownership is new and changed and like loads of you know their senior leadership have gone like the commitments to the women's team may well change i can't see it changing significantly no not with the dodgers massive, owner like, yeah, yeah exactly sense. it's a massive like um boost to have like a really successful uh women's team reputationally um but whether that the financial commitment stays in to quite the same level so i can hear my dog whining at a cow outside in the <laughs> i love it um, we love dogs here whenever uh yeah so what like chelsea and city are, like chelsea in particular are probably closest to barca and barca and leon and that's why they've uh you know kind of reached champions league final um didn't do so well last year but a few like mitigating circumstances that i think led to that um but um you know are still winning loads domestically because they are the ones that are closest um arsenal i mean you know you you look at things like the Beth Mead tweeting about the fact that they were given a whole load of some of the um, some of the kits and like training gear that had been produced and was like you know kind of real like nice stuff like some of the vintagey stuff and things um, and uh, but but she tweeted that they they had had to wear men's sizes because they hadn't made women's sizes of it um, things like that. And then, you know, to be fair to Arsenal, they then produce a Stella McCartney collaboration, which is great, right. right? Real, real nice stuff. Women's like not not just the men's stuff for women, but an actual range of women's like clothing. That's like a step. It shows they responded to it. But like the original, <laughs> the fact that they didn't think to make them in in women's cuts and sizes, not even as one offs for the team itself to wear, so they yeah. come out um to warm up in these massive like eight like oversized 80s track suits that are even more oversized because they're not shaped for them is like an indication of like where the pr is like right. covering up what's really going on sort of thing which is obviously hugely disappointing for any arsenal fan to hear um but yeah it's like i you know there are good things there but i think until you've got like an ownership that is just gonna throw money at it and say we invest in it and we believe in it then then not much is going to change that said it's great that arsenal put in six games on um and have committed in advance to putting six games on at the emirates next season no like chelsea when was the last time I played at stanford bridge it was the right. opening day of the 2019 season and they are like not doing it again at the moment there's no sign of them doing it uh, maybe they will next season, but they they did that. I mean, the atmosphere of that ground was absolutely rocking. So I don't know why they haven't. They had a really really good engagement for them fair base. It's like twenty over twenty thousand fans. Um, so there's like good signs, but I think like I think one of the problems is is that like clubs don't know how to market women's football um, mm -hmm. and get fans into stadiums. And I think part of the reason is is like you think of marketing departments of clubs, right? They're used to dealing with a very very engaged audience like one that is you know you, you you drop anything and people flock to it so you get you know probably people in marketing teams patting themselves on the back thinking they're doing a really brilliant job we've got this 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 much engagement on this bit of content or you know this mm -hmm. many people have bought this uh latest shirt or whatever it may be but the men's football audience is is like so so passionately engaged in football that it's not really hard to sell and then they're given the women's product and which is something that you do have to sell and you like have to pull people into grounds and they don't know how to do it they don't know how you actually get people to come through the door if they're not already pre-existing like hugely engaged um so that for me is like the biggest problem that all the english clubs are facing and i think that once they sort of solve that problem, then you might get them sort of taking it a little bit more seriously across the board, I suppose. But then it's a like chicken and egg situation because um, people take it seriously when you support it and put it in your main grounds. And like, look at the Euros, the stadium choices. Like if those games are being played at, you know, the Emirates, the Spurs Stadium, mm -hmm. St. James's Park, Ellen Road, Anfield, etc. Like, what does that say about 
what women's football and what the women's Euros is. Like, what perception does that show? That shows the world who know those grounds as the biggest grounds in England that this is a valued thing. Instead, we've got, you know, a quarter final at least Sports Village, which is reduced capacity because they're standing behind the goals so they'll be empty because UEFA don't allow it um you've got uh, Milton Keynes your Rotherham things like that you know they're not exactly people saying boom <laughs> this is um this is our best product and we're going to put it on in the best possible way I if, if I don't mind if you don't mind I interject for a second I think the to the to your last point I think a lot of people because I see it they it's almost like they rather not see an empty Old Trafford or an empty Anfield than mm -hmm. seeing a full Meadow Park. Mm -hmm. And I think that plays a lot in, in people's minds. Like, I'm of the belief, like, regarding PR, like, when it's almost like the, the answers to me are could be way easier than everybody sort of uh, makes it out to be. Like, when you have Jonas and Mikel Arteta, the way that you could make this a little bit better for the women's game is have Mikel Arteta, the guy that finished outside of the top four, that had a horrendous record this year, talk to the guy that finished one point off, right? The guy was better. He went to the Champions League. He got to the Champions League quarterfinal. Have the guy, like, frame it that way because mm -hmm. it's not like you're doing them him a favor. The reality is he's a better coach and he had a better team and he got to a better place. Um, when you have um, one player that stands out or former player like Ian Wright that is the sole force behind the support you know support of the women's team and you barely see any other uh, you know major player a major name legend of the club pay players pay those guys pay the Dennis Burke not that you need it because I believe Dennis Burke have even paid some of the salary for some of the women back in the day but take 10 11 15 of your legends and just beg them pay them if you have to to say something nice and then the the knuckle dragger that thinks women shouldn't be playing sports is going to have a, a a bit of a shock and be like wait a second uh you know robert pires says that you know that beth mead is good then she she has to be good because my idol says she's good so we might be able to shock some of these people into at least not being as misogynist as, as they are and i also think that like there's some fear of, of, of this repercussion, almost like in politics here in America, if you're a musician and you say who you support, you're afraid that you're going to lose half of your audience. It's not half of your audience. I think that people are, the club is so afraid to maybe say something or feature players, uh, male players going to Meadow Park and watching the girls. Like, how amazing would it be if you have, you know, five or six players from the first team going to watch and support the women and trying to turn some heads and trying to turn some attention and make it, Uh, uh, more p uh, palatable for those people that are hard to turn it like the, the answers to me seem to be there and as much as the the engagement that you said and the work that Aiden Small does is unbelievable I love so that. good I love he's him. the best he's I love best. him yeah. there th there seems to be somebody above it all like you're 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 somewhat saying Susie I don't want to put words in your mouth that there are um not fully investing in and that was a question that I had for you I I have a fear of like I we know that the women's game deserves more investment. Investment means money, which means ambition, which means toxic masculinity. And you know, it kind of becomes this thing where like with Chelsea having a lot of money, but I'm like, well that's Abramovich money. I do I I Demian I don't want anything to do with that. No player that has ever played for Chelsea, in my opinion, since Abramovich was owner. They all knew what they were signing up for. They all knew who was cutting their paycheck from Emma Hayes to Sam Kerr to whomever. And I'm not judging them personally. I'm just putting this as an example. Um, so do I, as an Arsenal fan in my high horse, in my, you know, holier than thou position, do I think that Stan Kroenke is any better? Do I, where does the money come from? Where do I want the money to come from? So those are things that I have sort of demons with and I battle with that I, part of me is like, no, just everybody just stay where you are. And I just want just Arsenal to win. We're up by one point. We don't need any more money. We don't need it. But obviously we do. Um, so that's kind of where I'm torn, and that's where I learned so much from you and so many other people that I follow online, and, and Laura Woods making amazing comments, Sophie, yourself, it, it's just endless amount of resources, but I think that at the end of the day, money is what's needed, money brings a lot of stuff that is not necessarily good uh, for women either, you know.
Oh, I totally agree. I like, I remember having this debate on, uh, not debate, like a friendly discussion, I suppose, on um, Football Weekly once where the, like, we were talking about Man City men um, and it was a couple of seasons ago when they were running away with the league, like no tomorrow. And um, uh, I, I remember like, like we just spent ages talking about um, like Qatar and um and like uae and that kind of money pouring into football and i was like how can you i said i can't remember who i said it to but i said it's one of the others one of the other guys in journalists like, the, the, can you appreciate like man city when you watch them play because i can't like i watch it and i just see like oil money running around the pitch and like you know um dollar signs above their yeah like and and like hanged uh lgbt kids and like things like that like i can't enjoy that football knowing what has bought it like it's not been won genuinely they're winning the league yes but at what cost like i i I find that very difficult to grapple with and like you say you know i feel the same i like hate uh, stan cronke i like i would like business out of football and it to be given to the fans and stuff um so yeah it's a difficult one when like the Women's Super League and the FA are sort of driving towards a like Premier League Mark II model and see the quickest way of reaching a professional game is what I believe they think is like relying on the big men's clubs that are backed by these sort of, you know, billionaire money men who don't actually care. And I think that's a problem because essentially what they're doing is they're trying to get them to invest to like make a professional league without any sort of real sort of substance beneath it and then they're hoping that the substance will come afterwards and that like right. suddenly the money will pour in from sponsors broadcasters and it is to a certain extent but not to the same extent that they then need people to keep investing from clubs into their women's teams with you know wages going up and transfer fees becoming more of a thing and all that kind of stuff so then you've got this sort of chicken and egg situation of you're, you're driving towards wanting a sustainable league. That's what everyone says they want. But then at the same time, you're sort of tied into this model that is about mm. more and more money from the men's game plowing into it. And like, I think, you know, like, I, I don't know what the answer is, but like, I'm very much like rip up the script, um, right. split the league. Would, would you rather see play. it be like American sports, Susie? How, how do you mean? With uh, in terms of ownership, salary caps. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'd like to see salary caps, and I'd like to see proper minimum salary levels as well, because like, you know, most of the players in the women's super league are on one year contracts, and you know, many get like twenty, thirty grand max. Um, so you know, how can you have any sort of sustainable existence when you, you know, could be like out on your ass every single year? Um, and on contracts that you know don't really provide much of a living um so like i think there needs to be a minimum salary i think there needs to be maximum salary i also think like we need to split from the idea of needing um like direct investment from clubs into their women's teams i would much rather see some kind mm. of levy on the premier league that says every club like you know 10 15 percent or more i'd take more um from of, of, my, of like revenue generated by the broadcast deal for the Premier League goes to women's football and then women's football decides how that is distributed among clubs in a very, very fair way that's going to grow a sustainable league from top to bottom um, and that kind of thing. And then that removes like the risk of, you know, an owner getting, you know, a bit like weary of their women's team or like having a bit of financial trouble themselves and deciding you know oh well the first thing to go would be the women's team so like for me some kind of like more collective uh funding model from the men's game into the women's game that removes Mm -hmm. the risk of you know kind of the whim of owners um i think would be a step forward but like that's just one idea that has come out of my head it's a big idea there's loads of ideas that like within women's football uh you know people could come up with if they were sort of willing to think outside the box a little bit and not just think right what's the quick fix the quick fix is we get all the premier league clubs on board and then they spend their money on women's football and you end up with this very uneven development and also not huge like in, like real commitment like look at man united they are just not investing in the women's team um and they i think they've been a little bit caught out they thought 
they wouldn't have to invest much and that they'd fly to the top get into the Champions League and start be competing. And then that would like, you know, domino effect. And then they'd invest a little bit more and it would get better and better. And it'd be such a wonderful PR project for them. And But the reality is you actually have to spend much more money than people think to have a successful women's team. And you have to have longevity and you have to like build something over time and give them the right facilities. Um, and now they're sort of in this like moment, the club as a whole of, deciding whether do we keep up with this and properly invest or do we do a Liverpool and rip the rug out um, and just let the team sort of fall into oblivion, which would be a PR disaster after so much was put into them Whoa. investing in the first Okay, rate. this last 20 minutes of this discussion is insane. It's so good, <laughs> so much rich content. You guys, if you're not eating this up and hitting the like button, I don't know what you're doing. This is magic because I don't know where to go, to be quite honest with you. I feel like we're going to need a part two to really kind of... I do have of... a question. Okay, go on, Demian, because I, I was going to go somewhere, but answer, ask your question uh, first because I'm so fascinated by the model of the US versus Europe. Like, I think being tied to those big clubs was always going to be a bonus for the women's game, um, but we can get to that. Go on, jump in. No, my question, since we're on the topic, had to do with something... Uh... I actually spoke about this on, on my my podcast a couple of days ago, which is because we, I'm including all of us, we end up having a deep emotional attachment to the players at Arsenal or in, in also in my case, the Dutch national team. Um, I worry, it's not like I stay up at night every day, but I worry what these players will do when they retire because you have mm. an average Great player, question. men's, player that played you know at Aston Villa for a couple I don't know Gabby Ekbonlahor or something like that not really the best footballer in the world or pundit or pundit oh, he I, I didn't say loud. that out. did I say that out loud I think I, I, I don't know you said but, it out loud uh, uh, he probably doesn't have to work ever in his life and he can do take part in any business he wants to he can open a restaurant or he can open a brand of by the way, I think I see a drum set behind Susie. It's the first time ever an Arsenal <laughs> podcast it's, show has true. had so was, many instruments. I've, I've just been waiting Look and waiting for you to spot. Yes. Like amazing! Oh, I've spotted. I spotted. <laughs> okay. uh, I just had self control. Um, so I, I wonder. I worry about them, and I'm like, you know, we have Jen Beatty's new contract, and how amazing that was, and how it incentivizes not only her working. Uh, in the academy with the academy players contracts but also sponsorship deals uh, but i worry about players that don't want to do anything related to football and they might want to do something else but if they're on 20 grand a year or something like that they might not be able to pursue that so how do you see the current crop of players where we are historically how do you see them living once they retire do you see it yeah, how do you see it? I'm not even going to prompt anything. Can, can I jump in real quick too and say I think Abby Wombach was a, one of the people. If It was either Abby's book or someone else's where she talked strongly about this. Or it might have even been Carly a few years ago, but the it's a brilliant question, Demian. Sorry Thank to you. jump in. No, you're good. Oh, no, it's it's so important. And it's like like something that's, actually, I, say, I was about to say quite overlooked, but actually it's like increasingly more and more things being done about it, like um, visa of, launched um a, a thing that's like being spearheaded by karen carney that is about helping players who are, who are players now prepare for what they're going to do afterwards like with various training and things like that but like yeah i mean historically all women's players have had to sort of think a little bit long term and have um you know whether it be like a job on the side or study you know erin cuthbert Aaron Cuthbert, you know, if you look at her Instagram, over the summer or like since the season finished, she's gone and graduated with her law degree, you know? She just won the league, played a really significant part um, in Chelsea's season, one of their best players in, in my mind, and she just finished her law degree, which she did part-time mm. whilst playing professional football, you know? So a lot of players are having to do that kind of stuff. But then they're the ones that make it. Like, there's so many players... I think that we're missing out on watching because they can't afford to stay in the game and they can't afford to um, 
uh like not think long term about their futures like you think of anyone who wants to have a kid for example like they can't like it's not right. possible if you're on a one year contract and potentially having to move every year to um to sort of have a kid and be a professional footballer so how many how many people are we missing out on watching that are hugely talented football players but can't just can't stay in the game can't fight like can't afford what it means and like when the women's super league went professional and the women's championship went semi-professional with like and i say those terms in the loosest possible way because i didn't really like you know the, the sort of salaries and hours that you're talking about aren't really professional mm -hmm. or semi-professional in my opinion it was more like a we sort of need that label to get the like you know big sponsors and broadcasters on board that then gets the money in that actually makes it professional almost you know like trying to trick <laughs> trick the chicken and egg <laughs> situation into um it, like into existence and um so yeah so there's the, basically you've got this you know this kind of situation where players um who were playing semi-professional football for top tier clubs or or even amateur football for top tier clubs um and working on the side suddenly the league within in less than a year of the announcement is going to be professional and they've got to make the decision of quitting their work and signing professionally on probably significantly wow. less money or leaving the game or dropping down to where they can play semi pro or amateur so like the and like that's one of the problems with like the professionalism of the game is like they announced it in in a season saying that it was going to be professional from the following season giving clubs no time to sort of financially prepare for what that would mean and plan and make it work and find a way to do it um, and build up to being pro and then you end up with situations like Yeovil um, you know kind of really really struggling financially and then falling out of the league um, and you've got a situation where players are having to like choose basically do they keep playing football on these you know like imagine a teacher like there's there's plenty of pet players that have been teachers or PE teachers having to decide whether they keep being a teacher and um and drop down a level or drop out of the game or give up their stable teaching job that probably pays them more than being a footballer for a one-year contract at the club that they're currently at um, in the hope that they're there longer term and the wages go up. It's a big, like a real hard decision for people to make. So you've got crazy things like that, but yeah. That's things crazy. Things are being done about it, but like we're not, we're nowhere near a point where a player could retire and just live off the money unless you're like, I mean, even even Sam Kerr, like she's on what rumours between three and 400,000 a year. Like, yes, that's a tidy sum of money, but in the course of like her time at Chelsea, it might not be as oh, she's actually got big sponsors. No, she's probably one of the few that will be all right. And just, you know, being an ex player with sponsorship mm -hmm. deals and like that, but it, just like slightly below that, the Aaron that, Cuthbert of the world aren't going to be able to do that. Yeah. The time. median, the average yeah. players aren't, exactly. you know, and I wonder if we could, could we help in any way? Do you see fans being able to have the power to uh, help these, these players that have given so much to us? Um, a good question i mean there, there has got to be ways hasn't there i mean just support for the game in and of itself and pioneering it and the growth of it and demanding better from clubs and investment into women's game and decent wages for players and minimum standards of the for like in fa contracts like why should it be that like you know this like i say so many players on one con one year contracts it, it's there's increasingly more going on to two year, three year contracts, but it's the top end of the spectrum rather than the bottom. Um, again, um, but like, you know, can we demand sort of minimum contract lengths or, or certain amount of notice before you you know, when you sign a one year contract, you know, can you get a little bit more notice of, you know, when you're going to be told that you're not being signed again? I know mm -hmm. players that have reached the end of the season, still not sure if they're signing for the club that they're, technically just finished that that kind of stuff so I, like, I think we can all demand that kind of stuff um then there's also you know like scholarship programs for players um you know there's quite a few of those around the country um like financially supporting that i know some fans Su sponsor Su players directly things like that too susie though the reality of how the men's game changed from 
Division One. I. I remember being a fan back then and thinking, oh, what's this going to be like? It, it was money. It was the infusion of money. The Premier League, 1992, money took everything to the next level. Then the TV rights deals took everything to the next level. Um, so could we potentially be, especially with the BT, was it Sky Sports last season um, and the deals, this is like the beginning of, and going back to your book, The Rise, Fall and Rise, is it the beginning of the influx of money? Money changes everything. It's the same. People talk about Arsenal all the time and they're like, what's going to change how fans think and this toxicity or whatever? I go, winning. Mm. Winning changes everything. Money changes everything. Unfortunately, it's like the modern day pandemic, but it's, the, it's a pandemic that we've been living with for years and years and years. It just evolves after time. It, do you feel like this is the moment where it's going to go like that so we don't have to worry about retirement and you know there's a little bit more wealth to go around for everybody as a like Emma, Beckham was play, earning six million dollars a year and the guy next to him was earning 50. It's the the elephant in the room is attendances right until they crack attendances they're not gonna like foot like women's football can't necessarily well, I argue it can but women's like the argument from a business point of view is women football can't justify um, like increased investment until you get in people through the door, spending their money, um, being um, consumers of it, then you're not gonna um, you're, you're you're just you're just not gonna get the investment. So until they crack attendances, and like I think it is a moment. Like in if England win the Euros, I, I think that's going to be. I Massive. can't even. I can't even like guess at how big that's going to be I think it's going to be absolutely huge if England win the Euros you know the first England team to win a major football tournament since 1966 if they do that like that that would be hugely significant and I think that would drive people through the doors at the start of the season on on a level that we've never seen before as long as the FA and clubs properly plan for that kind of um that kind of thing happening mm -hmm. even like a real good before that good like semi-finals or whatever potentially but winning it would be like, you know, sort of a next, next, next level for me. So yeah. it, it, it depends. Like I, I always think of tournament, like major tournaments in women's football is like moments of real, real qualitative change rather than the sort of like slow quantitative growth of the game. It, it's like really what changed. For, it's really what changed for the US women's teams too. Was and the Netherlands exactly. when they won the um, Euros. Yeah, it's absolutely. It exploded, yeah. yeah. Okay, so guys, I just looked at the time and it's 57 minutes. Wow. What I, f I really truly felt like we were in a cafe just, you know, <laughs> shooting the, the breeze about football. But I have, so we've, we haven't even done the Euros and we haven't even done the pop culture segment. So I'm going to say maybe during this time, Susie, you're going to be rammed with um, the Euros, right? But maybe we can have a I, Euro. We could do some quick fire stuff because the one thing I always want to do is give our listeners the opportunity to ask you questions, and they've really put in some great ones. So maybe if we could do these quick fire, and then you can quick fire tell us who you think is going to win the Euros as well. How about that? We could do pop culture it. stuff another day. Although that was probably your, the thing you were looking forward to the most. <laughs> always. <laughs> okay, um, Lone Star, who's one of our listeners in Texas. Plenty of male coaches managing women's teams. Why can't women manage men's teams? Oh, they so can. They just need people. Like, A, it needs um, people to take a chance on them. B, it needs, um, like, the pressure to not be... Like, imagine Emma Hayes going to manage a men's team, right? Well, Absolutely. firstly, all the clubs she's being linked with um, and has been linked with are really, really low-down men's clubs. Like, have a little bit more respect for the women's game give her a bigger job than than some of the ones that are being talked about because she's a phenomenally talented manager and would easily manage any men's team in the country. Hell, I'd give her the England men's job. You know, like She could do that in a heartbeat. She's her, her knowledge and insight in the game is just beyond anything ever. But the first person that does it, the pressure is going to be insane. I mean, like, mm -hmm. talk about, like... The pressure women can to handle succeed, it. Like the pressure can, to succeed. But if they fail, yeah. if they fail, then that could set things back. So, like, it, it just needs people to take a chance and, um, and also, like, someone to be given time as well. Because obviously, the biggest difference would be, like, yeah. um, knowledge of, like, youth teams and things like that and the young players coming through and all that kind of stuff. Like, the, like, Emma Hayes knows 
vir probably virtually every player playing the women's game in the world <laughs> at the age of like 14 and is tr already tr monitoring the best of them like it would take time for someone to get that kind of knowledge right uh, of the men's Okay, um, from Amira, um, here's uh, one for you. Thoughts on Arsenal giving fans renewing their men's season ticket the opportunity to also buy tickets for six WSL games at the Emirates for a discounted price? I think that's brilliant. Um, and the sooner we get the fixtures, so we actually know sort of where those games are going to be because we've only... Have, have the FA even announced the start of the season? I know when it is, I, but anyway. I, I have not seen that. Yeah, so I know when it is. Um, but the, the start <laughs> of the season, yeah, like like they've not even announced that. So where is like the fixtures for the whole season? How can fans fit that into their schedule and plan it in the same way that they immediately have their calendars syncing with all the men's fixtures? Like how how can you plan for that kind of stuff? So like until there's like a little bit of joined up thinking, but I think it's huge from Arsenal to have committed like ahead of time to six fixtures. Yeah, um, and like getting it in people's heads this early on that there are those six fi fixtures available is i yeah like a big step like i think that's a smart smart that's the move. happy part that i i was trying to describe earlier yeah. the things that they do do they mean it yeah. or is it like right. pr spinning uh, speaking of PR, like that, that i think is genuinely clever like yeah, genuinely yeah, that's a good idea good. Yeah. So Demian had to calm me down all season. He's like, so if she's not going anywhere, I'm like, I don't know. It's Arsenal. I don't trust it. And Ask here is asking you, KSC doesn't put money in men's team. It's hard to see them putting money in the women's team. But Viv is highest paid player in WSL now. I'm happy that she is staying. But I've got more messages from you for you that people have sent saying, is this one plus one for real or is it just one? I'm done. I've heard it's longer than one. Um, I don't know how long, but I have heard it's longer than one. Um, and uh, I was very, very surprised that she stayed. Um, you know, I was having one of those moments towards the end of the season where I was like, I, I didn't buy it. I didn't ever buy a shirt with Miriam's name on the back and now I'm never going to have <laughs> one. Like, I feel like that's something that I need in my collection and I missed out the opportunity. I've still not bought one. Could have borrowed one of Demian's. <laughs> He's got like every season. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so like, I, yeah, I, I thought she was gone. I was convinced that she was going um, probably to Barcelona was the most likely. Um, I'm delighted that she's staying um, and it's good that Arsenal clearly made the effort to sort of throw money at her and get her to stay um but yeah like i don't necessarily think that's a sign that we're going to see loads more investment from stan um okay. but you know she's a hugely marketable proposition like they probably make uh, she's a keeper what they've bought what, oh, what they're paying her in shirt sales alone you know she it's that kind of factor isn't it she's a trailblazer demian loves her Oh, I mean, yes. He's still not forgiven Arsenal for Van der Donk, so, you know, Never. Still, a, still a touchy one there. I mean, I couldn't, be, <laughs> I couldn't be happier for her, uh, but selfishly, I only want her to play for one club, and it's not Lyon. You know? I, I was oh. gutted that Jill Ward went as well. Like, oh, that was, yeah. That was that tough. was a knife here and then a knife yeah. in the back yeah. and then somebody <laughs> pushed me down the stairs. It was yeah. but, landing on a bed of nails. Yeah, yeah, but I'm happy with for no them. underwear I on. Be happier. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't be happier for them. And uh, yeah, Viv signing was massive, massive. OK, I've got this one for you and then we'll quickly get your take on who you think is going to win the Euros. Uh, this was this is a really important question, I think, from Chris, because it's a very topical time. Um, doesn't have to be too deep, but on the kind of surface of things, uh, what do you think, Susie, um, regarding Chris's question about a trans man joining a women's team and dominating? Is that something that people could accept, do you think? I think that's a hard question to answer because it's such a hypothetical situation, like that they would they would come in and dominate for one is like making right. assumptions about the situation um, and 
like that the, that we wouldn't know how, how do we know they'll come in and dominate they wouldn't necessarily you look at um oh I, like uh, laurel hubbard the weightlifter who you know mm-hmm. everyone thought was then gonna like smash it at the olympics and win gold and all of these um you know women at birth were going to be denied the right to win medals and she didn't even register uh, a complete lift like it's not necessarily that straightforward i totally support the right of trans athletes to compete in sport and to enjoy sport what is sport for like it's to have fun um and it's also to test the the limits of your body and a lot of it is about like a celebration of a genetic differences usain bolt's legs (laughs) um michael phelps's ridiculously large feet are we going to start putting them in you know like michael phelps in pool like only competing against um uh, people with similar like flipper like feet to him no we're not like right so what is sport for it's about like genetic difference and people pushing their bodies to the extreme um and you know beyond the realms of what you know most people would and like i think that you know if you start policing um like <laughs> like i don't know testosterone levels and that kind of stuff then you're you're getting into really murky territory about what sport mm-hmm. is for. Um, and it's also such a hypothetical, like, that you know, how many um, trans athletes c- are competing in the world? So, so few. Like, it's such a tiny minority. Why um, are we making such a big deal about it? Like, it's such a, such a tiny, tiny minority of, um, of, of, like athletes wanting to compete um and for me sport should be a welcoming place for anyone who wants to compete you know we've and also why is it always only this way around why is it not the other way around because you know we we, there's there's no reason um why it it like it it the conversation should go one way as well um you know yeah you've got you want a lone 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 stars should be able to play as well you know we've got quinn competing for uh canada um at the olympics the first non-binary athlete to win a olympic gold medal phenomenally talented player um you know we should be supportive of the rights of people to enjoy sport in my opinion okay and it was a tough question i'm glad you asked it thank you so much um for doing so now real quick before we get you out of here everyone you're getting six minutes of added time uh time has gone so fast it's amazing and we will come back and have more of these in-depth conversations with Susie. will you come back and join us again Susie, pretty soon 100 percent. okay awesome see you guys because there's a lot more to talk about threads from all of the conversations that we've been having together the biggest question of all is our girl gonna lift the big one come on <laughs> Is it happening? Is our other girl going to end up being the star of the tournament? That is is she going to lift the big one and put Harry Kane to shame? I cannot (laughs) wait. I would love it. As Kevin Keegan said, Susie, give me the good news. You know what? For months and months and months, I have been saying Sweden and the dark horse and and not the not so dark horses of this tournament um, and are going to win it and like just like are really, really strong. But I, I am struggling to see any other team with the depth that England has, like, on the bench. Um, it's shown in the past few games, like, they can really game change off the bench in a way, like, that I don't think any other team can. Um, then you've got, like, Serena Wiegmann is such a fantastically brilliant manager. I mean, mm. I was around the camp um, the past week. I was in Zurich, uh, Basel, and then Zurich, the team were training in Basel and then playing in Zurich and um like going to training the atmosphere is like fantastic and better than like I've ever experienced in a in an England camp like they are so relaxed and happy and Serena Wiegmann said to us that oh um like we you know we asked her you know why is it so important that the players play happy and that you have this really relaxed environment she was like i think back to my career as a player and i didn't always enjoy it um and i Mm. look back on it and i regret not enjoying it more and i want my players to enjoy it um and that's you know that's why we play sport and obviously if players are enjoying it they're going to play their best football right um so i think england have got the best chance they've ever had in the toughest euros there's ever been so it's not straightforward but like 
the, it's the squad depth and Serena that, for me, are the things that might make it come home as everyone is shouting in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They definitely, definitely are. Um, who's your money on, Demian? Well... Oh, come Forget on. it. I'm like, whatever. Come Let's on. just strike that question, shall we? If if Mark Parsons plays players where they should play, I'm I'm very confident that they'll at least get to the final. You mean he not was putting midfielders at left back? He was very, very good in the press conference actually after that after the England game where he was like Oof. totally hold my hands up. Hold this my is hands, my yeah. this is my fault. Um yeah. he was like I didn't protect the players enough. We're a couple of weeks behind England who had their season finished. The players all went on a break. Then they went into camp early before the um, international window actually even opened. They found a way to sort of bend that rule and get players into camp um, earlier than anyone else. And so he was like, we're a little bit behind. And this was the worst possible outcome from a game like this before we go into a major tournament. So he was totally like, you know, this is my fault. This is like the first half is much more reflective of what we, what we can do. Sure. The second half was me letting the players down by not protecting them enough when England threw on all of those pacey young players who are um, pretty good. Much more They're settled. pretty good. They're pretty good. I mean, it was. You know, I hope it's not like the par three Masters. You know, when someone wins it and then they go on to not really have a great Masters. Yeah. You know, like the pre, <laughs> the pre-game stuff. It's like me. Like someone I wanna... wins Queens and then yeah, like, I'll... out the first round of Wimbledon. I won an Arsenal v Tottenham um, North London derby quiz versus Anthony Costa on Sky Sport. And I said I'd rather lose this and win the North London derby. And you, we all know what happened there. So it's all my fault, really. I'm just saying. That's right. It's true. Um, okay, brilliant stuff. Before we let you go, a lot of people have been asking about Beth Mead. One Demian's just been raving about her, of course, all season. Can she be, can she be player of the tournament? Or who have you earmarked to be player of the tournament she gonna get enough game time what do you think I, I think she will um I think Lauren Hemp for me is the one to watch in this tournament she's so good isn't she it's annoying but she, yes when like, she plays it, so it, like good. very irritatingly absolutely brilliant and yeah. then also incredibly lovely and quiet and like unassuming like it was what I like about her is like her personality on the pitch compared to off the pitch is just so opposite she's a total like fearless beast on the pitch right like just will you know no matter who she's playing against it could be if she could be making a debut against the u.s women's national team and she will drive at that defense like she's playing you know like some guys from the pub down the road like she will just she just believes in herself and yet off the pitch she is just the quietest like like slightly shy um little girl almost I love that um and it's just so so weird but like also kind of like quite endearing as well but I, yeah I just I I struggle to look past her for a uh, potential player of the tournament like because she's done like she really saved City a lot last season um and then also when England were playing rubbish she was the one sort of silver lining in the end of sort of you know the olympics and neville's tenure and hegarisa era like she was the one player still playing well um so i think you know imagine what she can do when she's got a team around her that is actually there <laughs> there to yeah. play well yeah, yeah. too well that's um, so, yeah. uh, that's um yeah that's she's shout. a she's a fun yeah that's a good shout she's she's a fun play to watch another one i'm a bit jelly about you know, secretly when no one's watching, <laughs> you know. So, Susie, you have absolutely... Demian, she's... the See, everyone agrees. She's absolutely smashed it. Debut on the Highbury squad. Thank Woo! You. Thank you. That was Thank epic. You. Yes. Loved Thank it. You guys. It was fun. Yeah. Very, very fun. Right. Can you come back on during the Euros if you're not too busy writing incredible stories for The Guardian? Yeah, I mean, chuck me, like... I will. I'll chuck you in advance. Chuck me a message and okay. we'll see what we can do. Chuck me. We'll, we'll bribe her with drum her. drum lessons, Sophie. Totally. We'll I mean, it's with... my it's my son's drum kit. Mine's the guitar. I can just about play the guitar and the clarinet <laughs> and his is the drums. But he's got a broken arm, so he's like one-handed ah. at the moment. Just boom, boom. Ah. I feel a duet coming on with Demian one day soon, that's for sure. <laughs> we'll do it, yes. Um, and we're going to, when we have Susie back, listen, this is a book we'll talk about for a long time. It's an evergreen title. It's not going anywhere and it's a phenomenal 
phenomenal story uh, about the women's game and truly kind of the obstacles that have been faced and the history and how we're now able to digest and watch the game as well. Where can everyone find it, Susie, please? Absolutely everywhere. Um, Amazon, or if you hate Amazon like I do, <laughs> um, Waterstones, The Guardian Bookshop, Faber's website directly. I mean, WH Smith is pretty much everywhere. Um, okay. And you can order it into most bookshops as well, which is cool. Awesome. In the U.S., it'll be available on the 5th. Am I correct? It's uh, The date keeps changing. They've okay. got some issues because of um, COVID uh, Im- impacting paper delivery. Got so it. I'm waiting to find out the final date because it's just been pushed back a little bit. But I think I, like it's going to be in, it's in the summer, but I don't know the exact date yet. And they're going to let me know. And when we I can do, get it on Kindle, right? Because I pre-ordered it on Kindle already. Yeah, sure. you can get on Kindle. There's an audio book in the US. There's an audio book in the UK as well. Um, there's a Japanese edition coming out in like November or something too, which is pretty wow. awesome. Um, nice. I can't wait to look at it and pretend like I can read it um, or understand <laughs> it. But... Awesome. Well, you've garnered some new fans here on Highbury Squad. Reggie and um, uh, Harold's buying the book. Um, everyone wants you to play the guitar now. Uh, is it, but that has audio. Yes. So all of those things, you guys will put it in the description as well on the YouTube channel. Please share this episode with your friends. We've done some shows this week that aren't about transfers and who's going where we've talked about our community, people doing great things, trailblazers from our disabled Arsenal community, um, to having Susie, who's a trailblazer writer in the women's universe of football as well. We're going to be back on Monday Night Live. Super Kev and Lee judges will be joining us for a little summer series. Um, You get to find out Lee's favourite television show. Just real quick, Susie, what is your favourite film of all time? And we'll get you out on this one and we'll do that second second episode. Oh, wow. What one's hit me with? Um, (laughs) Favourite film of all time? Oh, I'm... I, I'm going to say it and then I'm probably going to change my mind, but Eight Men Out. The, Ooh, that's a good movie. Yeah. yeah the, the story of the... Black Sox. The, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you'd asked me TV show, I would have gone The Wire. So that's the kind of vibe I like. Very good. Very good. Okay, good taste. Demian, why don't you take us out? I see you always do this and I always forget. I love putting it every my, single every time. time. I've been Any... here 30 times and I More. always mess it up. So I'm going to defer to you, Sophie. I'm sorry. Listen, have a good weekend, kids. Lots of good sports out there. Get outdoors, you know, start looking up. Don't look down as much. Don't worry about the transfer market. The women's Euros are coming. Susie Rack is a legend. Demi and you're a legend. Good night. God bless. We'll see you Monday. Have a great weekend. Happy July 4 to our US listeners. God bless America. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad.